made note of the fact that I was telling a story about a lady that came to our church in Somerville. Well, this morning I have live proof that Somerville has churches. Um, we, uh, we are blessed to have Mary Bryce Herbert Robinson in our congregation this morning. That's Bryce Herbert's granddaughter. Everybody here remember Bryce Herbert? Yeah, you remember Bryce Herbert? Well, Mary Bryce, would you stand up and just let them see who you are? This is the granddaughter. She's here today because they have some things that they want to see if Buncombe Street would like to have in their archives. And they've graciously driven from Somerville and brought those things here. And uh, following the service, we're going to take them up to the archives room and show them how we, how we do that. And uh, we're just honored to have you here. Thank you for coming. We appreciate your presence. This morning, I want to read the text. I am not known for brevity. Um, people have told me that for 42 years now. Uh, I don't think it's going to change anytime soon. But I do want to read a, bra a rather brief text, however important it really is. It's from Luke's Gospel in the sixth chapter. And it's two verses, verses 37 and 38. And out of reverence for the gospel, I would invite you to stand. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be in your lap. For the measure you give will be the measure you get back. This is the word of God for the people of God. Please be seated. I didn't get permission to do this. I'm going to do it anyway. Mary Jane, do you remember when Jerry was helping us with our new member classes? And I used to have all kind of trouble with Jerry because he wanted, he told people stuff that I didn't understand because I was just fresh out of Duke and I thought everything was about grace, all about grace. Tell them about grace. Don't tell them about anything hard. And then Jerry would get up and do his thing. And this is what he would say. He'd say, Bob's just finished telling you all about grace, but let me tell you about the reality of church life. And the reality of church life is this. What you invest is exactly what you will receive. What you don't invest, you will not receive. I can hear him light saying that right now. He told us that all the time. Well, an author and spiritual director person named Richard Foster, somebody that I've read for 30 years, said that the great moral question of our time is how we move from greed to generosity. Greed. The Bible calls it avarice or covetousness. Greed is the gratification of my desires, often at the expense of the common good. We all have a need for greed. We're born greedy. Don't believe me? Watch a baby. Watch a baby. They are focused on one thing, and that's their own survival. And that makes perfect sense. That's not a slam at a baby. It's the reality of the way we've been made. It'd be easy today to talk about the greediness of the powerful pocketing millions of dollars illegally. It would be easy for us to con 
be convinced to criticize the extravagant lifestyles of the rich and famous, the music stars, the football heroes. But that's not why we're here or what I intend to do. I want to talk about me. I want to talk about you. I want to talk about those personal desires and hidden needs that, that live inside the very best of us. I want to talk about the deadly sins of Christians, not football players or music stars, of Christians. Mm. What appears to be extravagant to some becomes something nice to have tomorrow. We were born with the need to get, to get to get. Something I really need becomes something I can't live without. I've got to have it. I want to tell you that there's a better way to live. For years, the church has taught about God's stewardship we talk about stewardship all the time, and stewardship is a biblical concept and a faithful way to live. It reminds us that everything comes from God and belongs to God, and we are stewards. That's where the word stewardship comes from. I remember the first time I met her. It was easy to see why, while she was still living here, I going to make the best of it. This was not her home. She did the best she could. You see, she had come to Somerville because after years of independence, she was in need of care. Her family was nowhere around, and so she came to Somerville to be with some of them. She had come because she needed a place. I learned that she quickly didn't, didn't have much to say unless she had something to say. Have you known people like that? She didn't have much to say unless she had something to say, and if she did, you better be listening. Shortly after she came, she joined our church. And I learned quickly that she was of that generation that believed in being faithful to her commitments. And the first day I met her, she told me she needed offering envelopes for her pledge. I was still at the hospital visiting her. She said she needed offering envelopes for her pledge and that she had not received hers yet and she wanted them. It was the first time in my ministry that I felt as though I had been chided for not making provision for a person to give money to the church. I didn't know that would ever happen in my life, but it did once. What I came to understand about her was that for her, it was not about her at all. It was always about her Lord and her faithfulness to him. It's how she lived. In her simplicity of focus, in her generosity with what she had, but most of all, in her abiding love for God and faithfulness to his church. I believe in stewardship as a Christian discipline, but this is what I want you to hear. The joy comes not from the discipline, but from the generosity. Finding a generous place in your heart to be used of God for the things that God is doing far beyond anything you have made available. God's doing something in generosity. Rabbi Harold Kushner wrote in a book entitled, When All You've Ever Wanted Isn't Enough. 
Have any of you ever read that? When all you've ever wanted isn't enough. Kushner is a rabbi. Remarkable mind. He understands Christians maybe better than most Christians do. And in it he said, money and power do not satisfy that unnameable hunger of the soul. Even the rich and powerful find themselves yearning for, for something more. They know, they know something the rest of us have yet to discover. If we have it all, we still won't be happy. Somebody needs to write a new book. Not on how to be happy. We don't need another book on how to be successful. We don't need another book on, on how to manage well. We need a book on how to be human. Really human. Fully human. How to live as the child of God. We need a book on, on how to be content with enough. We could use a book like that. It would change the way we look at the world and ourselves. Transformation happens when we, when we make a decision like the lady in the hospital. When we make a decision that it's not about us anymore. See, the only antidote for greed is generosity. Is generosity. Jesus told the rich young ruler, you lack one thing. Sell all that you have and give the money to the poor and you will have riches in heaven. Then come and follow me. The Bible says that at this, the man's face fell. He went away and sad because, because he had great wealth. Ouch. This kind of talk, talk scares me. I would have said it differently. I would have suggested he increase his pledge next year. Would you consider tithing your income? But to tell him to sell everything he had, give it to the poor, and come and follow me, wow. When people come to me talking that way, I get kind of nar nervous about it. It kind of bothers me. It makes me a little frightened. They, they come in and sit down in my office and they say, I want to pitch my occupation. I want to pack up my family. I want to go to seminary. Now, I know I'm in my late 40s, but that's what I want to do. That's what God is calling me to do. And I'm going, whoa, whoa, whoa. Why don't you just try teaching a junior high Sunday school class? Uh, there, there are better ways to do this. You don't have to do that. Unless you just can't escape it. And most of the people who've stood in this pulpit for the last hundred years stood here because they just couldn't escape it. Sometimes you just have to let go and let God and believe that what God is doing is what matters most. Jesus wasn't pulling any punches when he turned around to his disciples and he said, I've got news for you. It's almost impossible for you people who have money to, to get into the kingdom of God. How hard it is, will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. It's like stuffing a camel through the eye of a needle. Hard, tough, demanding. Now don't throw tomatoes. I didn't write this. Jesus did. 
Why? Because radical problems call for extreme makeovers. It takes some crunching of of all of us self-sufficient people to admit our need for God. It takes the Holy Spirit to teach us how to know what is right and what things we need and what things we ought to let go. You see, greed is grounded in fear. We fear what we may not have. We fear not having the fundamental necessities of life. We fear a lack of food and shelter and safety and stability. So we keep saving for that rainy day. But when is it enough? When have we completed that part of our safety? Generosity, on the other hand, generosity is grounded in faith. Meanwhile, Jesus says, relax, don't be so preoccupied with getting. If God gives attention to the wildflowers of the field, don't you think he'll give some attention to you too? So stop worrying. Stop worrying. Are you willing to live by our national motto? You all do know what our national motto is, don't you? It's on all the coins you have. And it says, in God we trust. Well, do we or don't we? Isn't that the real question of life? You see, what is impossible with us is possible with God. Maybe the most important phrase I have ever read from the lips of Jesus is this. It is more blessed to give than to receive. And learning to live that way will transform your life. May you be blessed. Amen. Stand with me as we affirm our faith together. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is the one true church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now declare. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth 